Do we have free choice or is everything in our life predetermined? Big question. There was a cynic that put it this way. We must believe in free will. We have no choice. In the beginning of the 19th century, there was a philosopher, mathematician, scientist, Pierre Simon Laplace, a French thinker, who made the following statement. It's called causal determinism. that if there was an intellect that was able to know all the data of the past, the present, we'd be able to predict everything in the future. Some called it Laplace's demon. The only problem is we don't have all the data. But if we had all the data, because everything at the end of the day is a process of action, reaction, which would also imply that there's no concept of free will. We just don't know because we don't have all the information. Obviously, it created created some uproar in religious circles. Now, in the 19th, 20th century, with the discovery of quantum mechanics and the indeterminism and the probabilities of that state of quantum on a microscopic level, some say that countered Laplace's statement because it's not just a matter of lack of data, it's truly indeterministic. Please join me in this important discussion. Free choice versus determinism. Hi, Simon Jacobson here. We'll be speaking about free choice versus determinism. This program is dedicated by Aura Wolf Yona in loving memory of her wonderful stepfather, Shal Zelig ben Velvel. May his neshama be in the highest light of Hashem. Free choice versus determinism. Do we have true free will or not? Or is everything predetermined? It's a question everybody will face and, and ask, not just once in our lifetimes, but many times. When I make my choices, is there some other factor that's pushing me? Or do I really choose freely? In 1814, a French philosopher thinker, name was Pierre Simon Laplace, he came out with a theory. He wasn't the only one, but he was the one of the first in an essay called The Philosophical Essay on Probabilities where he stated the concept of causal determinism. Let me read the actual language. We may regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its past and the cause of its future. An intellect which at a certain moment would know all forces that set nature in motion and all positions of all items of which nature is composed, if this intellect were also vast enough to submit these data to analysis, it would embrace in a single formula the movements of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the tiniest atom. For such an intellect, nothing would be uncertain, and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. Taking this into the personal level, which suggests that a human being is also part of this machine, that if you had all the data on a human being, you'd be able to predict what that person will choose or how they will behave till the end of time. Which would seemingly eliminate the concept of free choice. The only problem is we don't have the data. And maybe it's impossible to gather all the data on any individual. Now, some countered Laplace's argument. Some called it Laplace's demon. Demon is like this machine, this intellect that would know it all. Some countered that in the 20th century with the discovery of quantum mechanics 
which was a discovery that was completely bizarre and, 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 and counterintuitive, that on a microscopic level, there are indeed states of indeterminism, fundamental indeterminism, not because of lack of data, that's just a state, some call it states of probability, where until you measure it or observe it, it can go two different directions. And it's not, again, because of lack of data or information. True, it's on a microscopic level, but there is the concept of true indeterminism, which in turn could be argued would allow, again, for the concept of free will, because there's no force that controls and determines whether we know about it or don't, whether it's visible or invisible, that determines the choices we make. Now, this isn't just a theoretical discussion, obviously. This is, affects everything we do, our responsibilities, our accountability, our expectations. Can you expect of a person who has a temptation or a desire or a lust or is seduced by something to truly choose? It could be that we're like animals in the wild. We will never prosecute a predator because they went hunting, because that's the way they're wired. Predator prey, it's part of nature. So why is it with human beings do we prosecute? Is there such a thing as laws of right and wrong and morality? So the argument would be because we need to coexist. Not because necessarily there's true free will, we need to coexist. And since humans have an intelligence and we see that we could control ourselves to some extent, so you could expect there's a red light and green light that by a red light you should stop so the other cars going the other direction can, pa- can go and then the lights change and then you can travel. So it's basically a convenient negotiation. And there's expectations. But those that don't accept real free will will say, that doesn't mean there's real free will, it means in a civil society we need to create some rules but when it comes down to it, just as we talk about causal determin- determinism, you can also talk about Darwinism as in the context of social Darwinism, which is that, or in the words of Freud, some, I like to call it the, Dar- the Freud- Darwinian model, the Darwinian-Freudian model, that we have an id that drives us, and it's all not in our control. You, there's an ego and a superego. You can impose certain rules, But push comes to shove, survival of the fittest. Now, obviously, I'm going to be making a case that's not that. Just make it clear before (laughs) I get carried away here. But it's important to address. One cynic put it, I believe it was Isaac Basheva Singer. He said, we must believe in free will. We have no choice. So there you go. That's circular thinking. So what is the counter-argument? And as I said before, the consequences are quite far, far-reaching and profound. It affects our very being. Yes, we can all expect to live in civilly and coexist. But basically, if we don't really have free will, wars are inevitable. Can we really create a utopian society when at heart people can be naturally selfish or narcissistic or greedy, driven by self-interest. On a personal note, the choices we make of virtue, of kindness, compassion, empathy, and pay a price for it, it, does it matter? Is it meaningful? I don't just mean meaningful, it makes makes us feel good on a fundamental bigger level. So it's a big issue. Now, of course, from the world I come from, when I say I come from, I feel myself as a universal citizen, I consider myself a universal citizen, but still I grew up in a traditional Jewish home, deeply steeped in Torah scholarship, the community. I tried to catch up. Especially the mystical side of it. And in the words of Maimonides, he says, free will is a critical foundation, a necessary a critical foundation of all of Judaism, all of Torah, we say all of faith. Because if you take that away, the concept of reward and punishment, the, consequent, the concept of expectations, of right and wrong, which lies at the heart 
of any religious community and society disappears. Which means it's not just for us to be able to get along and coexist. It's a fundamental. In, in different words, if there's a God, and God created existence with purpose, and put the human being in this world to live up to that purpose, that means the human being has to have free will. Or else, what is it? A puppet show? A game? All pre, predetermined? Are there real expectations of us? Are we just puppets? And that's impossible to say from that point of view. If someone were to argue there is no God, there's no purpose, and we're just random creatures that came here by accident, then you could say, yes, we're like no other creatures in the wild. We're wired a certain way. We also happen to have evolved with intelligence, so there are expectations, as I said. It makes sense even for selfish reasons, for evolutionary reasons, for survival reasons, to coexist with others or else we end up killing each other. But that's a very different approach. As you know, I am not here to go prove anything. I don't believe that ultimately they're absolute proofs. They're choices we make. Yes, no pun intended, choices we make. An intelligent person, and this is my approach generally, let's look at all the different factors, the different theories, and then see what resonates. Because let me explain why I'm saying that. Because even when you find an absolute proof for something, if your emotions are aroused or stimulated, all logic is thrown to the side. Let's be honest. We all can admit that, hopefully. I can admit it. Rational is very powerful. The brain is a very powerful tool. But when there's personal interest, self-interest, or especially if something tempts you and you're drawn, your impulses often will be more powerful than your intellect. As a matter of fact, the biggest choices in life we make are not purely intellectual. We would hope that the mind informs us, but the heart and the emotions are very much involved. That's number one, especially when it comes to things like self-interest. Number two, is there such a thing as an absolute proof? I mean, let's say you were able to find absolute proof that God exists. So then why don't 8 billion people just accept that proof, if it's so absolute? I'll take it further. If it's an absolute proof, why do people who believe in God behave in ways that we know are counter to what God wants? If it's so absolute, because the mind and actions, like I said before, the emotions don't always are, there's dissonance. So you can firmly claim you believe in God, but behave counter to what God would expect of you. We see this all the time. Which tells me that the proof may be there, but doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily internalized and integrated. And as such, the best approach is, I would call it, experiential proof. Do you have proof that when you listen to music, it uh, it's, uh, resonates with you? You don't have proof. You could be hooked up to all kinds of sensors and you see your blood pressure goes up and you different d- dopamine uh, the chemicals start shooting and you feel good and harmonious and so on. Is that what makes the music touch you? Just because there's documentation and data and, phys- and mathematical proofs? Because you feel it, and experience it, and that's it. Can you be manipulated? Can someone do something to manipulate? Yes, that's possible. That's why we have minds, and that's why we need to sift and discover and do due diligence till we come to some type of clarity as much as we're able to. Love. Prove that you love someone. It's a feeling, and it's very powerful, and it's more powerful than intellect. So I want to take the same approach with free will and determinism. To just present another story, another narrative, in contrast to, let's say, Laplace or others that talk about absolute determinism, and choose. As intelligent people, let's look at everything objectively, without any personal prejudice or bias, and see what resonates. Because this is far more than just a philosophical discussion. It's a life choice. And I use that word very deliberately, life choice. So the question is not about determinism and about free will or free choice. The question is, goes all the way back to the initial axioms of how we see our lives. The theory, one theory goes, one of the prevalent theories of today is that light does not have purpose or design. It's all an accident. When I say accident, it does not mean that it's not, there's no organization. I mean, clearly life has 
is organized. For life to exist, there need to be so many variables, some called the miracle of nature. But is there a higher purpose? Some will argue no. You were born, just like bacteria develop, we develop. But we take ourselves seriously because we're more intelligent. We can control. Our intelligence has the ability to dominate over other species. However, you continue to explain it. The counter argument to that is that we are here absolutely for a purpose. You exist because you were sent to this world on a mission. And you and only you can fulfill that mission. And the same with me and the same with every, every individual on this earth. That dictates, purpose dictates, that we need to understand what that purpose is. So the next step of this axiom is that the purpose is for you to come to this world, a selfish world on its own, a world that conceals its deeper purpose, that can be driven by selfish interests. And instead of doing that, bring beauty, light, virtue, compassion, empathy to the world. In the words of our sages, build a divine home in this lowest and darkest of worlds. Why is it low and dark? Because you can live in this world and we have duplicity, hypocrisy, selfishness, war, divisiveness, but we also can choose to bring into the world unity, harmony. And that's our choice. And it has to be a choice, because if not, the whole purpose would be lost. As I mentioned before, if we were puppets and robots, what's the point? So we're actually partners with the divine, with the transcendent, to bring transcendence in this world. God provides the resources, gives you life, gives you faculties, gives you gifts and skills and tools, intelligence, feelings, experiences, connections. Another way of putting it in more psychological terms, a world that can be detached, let's create fundamental attachment instead of detachment. And the nature of a human being and the nature of the universe gravitates toward unity. Every scientist will tell you, we're searching for unity. We're searching for the unified field principle or unified field theory. All scientific laws to try to explain different phenomena with, a sim with similar laws. You give a child a bunch of objects of different shapes and sizes and they'll fit them in naturally. We abhor disorganization and chaos. Look at the feeling we have when you come home or you come into a room when, where everything is organized. You feel like you belong. So all that indicates on the purpose of take, creating unity in a fragmented world. And look, a child is born after nine months being completely submerged in the embryonic fluids and waters of its mother. The early years of a healthy child completely embraced and cradled and cuddled and nursed and nurtured. These are not just nice things. It's critical to a child's building confidence, validation, that when the child grows into an adult, goes out into the world, has something from the inside, a deeper in self-esteem and self-confidence. And when you don't have it, look what, how it affects our lives. To me, those are not theories. Those are empirical experiences. When you are in love, and you're loved and you, are, you love and are loved, you know there's something that seems to be right with life. And we all look for that. Whether we find it or not, another story. Whether we have obstacles is also another story. And I'm not dismissing it. But it's something we, are, we seek naturally because we're seeking unity. We're seeking attachment. We're seeking love in the world that can sometimes be very unloving and painful. And when we have that love, we can deal with any pain in life. All that, if you think about it, builds the case for free will. Why? Because it means that we have that choice to make. We're not predetermined predators or prey. We're not predetermined wired 
just for our own survival and our own self-interest. We have the ability to love another and forego our own interests. Yes, people will do things for another. We'll sacrifice ourselves. Now, yes, you can make the argument that's also in self-interest. Again, I'm not looking for an absolute proof. But what resonates? Do you want to say that all love and all sacrifices and all nobility and dignity is all based on just survival of the fittest? You want to force that argument? Fine. But the counter-argument is, no, it's all part of purpose. It's all part of the choices we make. And the choices we make don't live on and don't die with us. Even long after we're gone, they affect generations. So it's actually eternity that we're discussing here. The eternity of our lives. The eternal legacy that we live, leave and live for. All of that is part of the case for purpose and therefore free will. Are there things that are determined, predetermined? Absolutely. Whether you'll be five feet ten or six foot six five, whether you have brown eyes or blue eyes. Many other features of our very genetic makeup is not up to us, and you can't change it. I'm not talking about through cosmetics, cosmetic or plastic surgery or other things like that. Part of our personality. But that's not about right and wrong. That's not free will. That's the factors, just like many circumstances. Most circumstances, where you were born, who your parents are, what schools they sent you to. It's all not, you haven't chosen. By the time you're an adult, I can choose. Many choices were made for you. But what you have complete choice about is your attitude to it. How will you navigate this set of cards that were given to you? People born in wealth, you could say have privilege, and you see they can, they can also take, that, take it for granted and become miserable people, arrogant people. But they also have the choice to be noble people and beautiful people. Others born in poverty, you could say they have everything going against them. And some indeed become bitter and angry and jealous. And others rise to the occasion are most refined human beings. So in other words, the circumstances don't determine how your attitude. And there there are endless examples. So free will, therefore, is part of the very dignity of life. And it's not just, you know, I don't like to feel I'm a robot and a puppet. And therefore free will is developed to give me a sense of uh, freedom. It's the other way around. Free will is part and parcel of the dignity of life and the choices we make. That when you're with a human being, you have a choice. You're going to be giving or you're going to be taking. You're going to be selfless or selfish. In other words, we may have a real impact on the world around us, on the people around us. And if it was all predetermined, you have no impact. It's not up to you. It's someone else pulling the strings or random accidents. It also gives your life meaning, purpose, the choices you've made, as well as the mistakes, because then you're accountable. And when you're accountable, that's also dignity, accountability. It's not just who cares one way or the other. Someone cares. The people you love that care. Other people around you, the world, and God cares. So it's another way of looking at life. It's not just free will versus determinism. It's are you going to live a life of purpose and choices that you will be making literally 24-7? Or whatever comes my way, I react to. It's also the difference between being reactive and proactive. Reactive, okay, things come my way, I'll deal with it. I'll use my wisdom, I'll use my, my, uh, my, my cunning, my intelligence, my experience to manage. Proactive means, no, you are sent on a mission. You are meant to initiate, to make things happen. You have something to contribute that only you can contribute. And and that's also your free will. Will you live up to that? Will you actualize your great potential? Not just make it, not just manage, not just make enough money to enjoy life. But it's a purpose-driven life, a mission-centric life instead of an egocentric life. And the implications go on and on. So the issue is not just one whether you can prove it. Now that we know there's indeterminism, fundamental indeterminism, 
And yes, there are things that are completely deterministic. Look at nature. You can predict, essentially, the change of seasons. It's not called a prediction, actually. It's clockwork. When the sun will rise to the second, the movement of planets. Yes, there are irregularities. But with different instruments and different measurements, we can know exactly what is going to be tomorrow. But these are all the stages set. That's not what you will do with it. It's not your attitude and how you navigate it. There will be an eclipse. Yes, you'll know there's an eclipse, but how are you going to react to it? Some things are predictable because we can know the data. Sometimes we don't know the data. So the plus is correct. If you know the data, certain things are completely deterministic, but not the final frontier. Your choice and my choice. And I'll leave you with one final thought on this. In the theory, in Heisenberg's theory, uncertainty principle, it's called, which is uncertainty, indeterminism, probability, that you can never know the position and velocity of an atom until you measure it or observe it because it's in that state of probability. There are different theories for this. So one of the bizarre results of that is that the observer impacts something that he, that he or she is not touching, just observation, which went counter the very concept of the objective scientist, the objective observer, that we watch something behind a glass pane or wherever it may be, and we don't affect it. And that too is quite weird, because why? I look at this table, and this table is affected by me. If I move the table, it's affected. If I break the table. But, but I want to posit a hypothesis here. That if that indeed is the case, perhaps we will never discover the unified field theory until we make peace with ourselves. Because if our observation affects the world around us, so not just that we have free will, but as long as we don't have harmony, the world around us won't have total unity and harmony. In other words, it's not just discovering a theory out there, it's feeling a sense of total unity within ourselves connected to our purpose that will determine whether we can actually find unity in the world around us. In other words, the world senses that we have a little fragmentation so you'll never discover that seamlessness. So our free will and our free choice, when we choose properly to live up to our highest standards of being, being ambassadors of light, of unity, of singularity, of seamlessness in a fragmented and broken world, indeed affects the very world itself, that the world too will cooperate and discover that harmony. And that's the final frontier. So as long as we don't achieve that, we won't be able to ac accomplish that unity in the world around us. Think about it, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. This has been Simon Jacobson, Meaningful Life Center, MeaningfulLife.com. Check it out. A, full, a wide array <coughs> excuse me, of offerings, different subject matter. Love to hear your feedback, your thoughts, your questions, your comments. And please share. It's another way of creating that unity. And yes, you have the free will to be the greatest and the best possible person and to turn your routine, mundane life into a divine, magical, transcendent one. Be well and be blessed. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com slash donate.